It's 8 o'clock, so we're going to get started. I appreciate that you're here. I think we have a good session for you, a very informational session for you, in store for you today. Well, we will get started with a reflection. This one is called God's Coffee. A group of alumni, highly established in their careers, got together to visit their old university professor. Conversations soon turned into complaints about stress in work and in life. Offering his guests coffee, the professor went to the kitchen and returned with a large pot of coffee and an assortment of cups. Porcelain, plastic, glass, crystal, some plain looking, some expensive, some even exquisite, telling them to help themselves to the coffee. When all the students had a cup of coffee in hand, the professor said, if you noticed, all the nice looking expensive cups were taken up, leaving behind the plain and the cheap ones. Well, it's normal for you to want only the best for yourselves. That is the source of your problems and stress. Be assured that the cup itself adds no quality to the coffee. In most cases, it's just more expensive, and in some cases, it, e it even hides what we drink. What all of you really wanted was coffee, not the cup, but you consciously went for the best cups, and then you began eyeing each other's cups. Now consider this. Life is the coffee. The jobs, money, and possessions in position in society are the cups. They are just tools to hold and contain life, and the type of cup we have does not define nor change the quality of life we live. Sometimes by concentrating only on the cup, we fail to enjoy the coffee God has provided us. God brews the coffee, not the cups. Enjoy your coffee. The happiest people don't have the best of everything. They just make the best of everything. Live simply, love generously, care deeply, speak kindly, and leave the rest to God. Health reform. Um, have you ever heard of the phrase, may you live in interesting times? It, uh, it was originally thought to be a, a Chinese curse, but, but it's not a curse. It really wasn't, it, it, and it actually isn't even Chinese. Um, it, it, it's actually an ironic phrase that was um, invented by some British ambassador to China that just said in the 1930s, boy, we live in, in an interesting age. Um, well, health reform is an interesting time. Um, right now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a broader topic, and we're really going to narrow it down when Steve and Sue come up and start talking about some of the specifics. Because when we think of health reform, I think one of the things that most people think about is the Affordable Care Act. But it's much, much more than that. And I probably don't have to tell you most of that, but you've been living health reform. You've been living health reform with the Affordable Care Act, meaningful use, this idea of leaving um, clinician, physician-centeredness to patient-centeredness. We have ACOs. We have health information exchanges. Um, we have quality measures and quality metrics. Um, this is everything that we're living when we come to work. So it's more than the Affordable Care Act. What I want to do is I want to let you know a little bit more about why this is happening. Um, we can go to the next slide. I'm going to talk to you about uh, my uh, dinner table. Um, I'm able to capture my family, or my wife is, able to capture us at least four times um, a week to sit us all around the table. And I have an eight-year-old boy and an 11-year-old girl. And one day my son, eight years old, actually says, well, Dad, how was work today? And I said, well, you know, son, health reform is really keeping me jumping. He was already lost by that. Um, <laughs> You know, my daughter's kind of still listening. My wife is like, oh, well, what, what, what is health reform? Why, why, why are we in all this? What, what are you talking about? And I go to this wonderful thing, like, oh, they're interested. You know, it's the U.S. health care counts for 17% of our gross domestic product. And, you know, by 2020, it's going to be up to 20%. Oh, my daughter is gone. You know, my wife's kind of, yeah, okay, what does this all mean? Well, you know, what this means is it's expensive. Healthcare is expensive. And when I mean expensive, the gross domestic product, I think something around $16 trillion. So I'm trying to talk about trillions, and my, my daughter goes, hey, that's a one followed by 12 zeros. And I'm like, good job, Katrina. You're right. You know, a million times a million, a trillion. So we're talking some really big bucks. But, but what happened? It's always been expensive. Well, I think what's happened is, is we've gotten to a point where a lot of people now go to work just to pay for health care. You know, they don't go to work anymore to save up just for the house or the car or a vacation. It's, you know, I got to go to work to, 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 to pay for my health care. And that's, 
it, it's reached a point where businesses are feeling it in a very impactful way. People are feeling it in a very impactful way. Um, and, it's, and it's really a, a reality. And it's just reached that point where something had to happen. Um, so I try to explain this. My, my son says, do I have to finish my milk? And I'm like, yeah, you have to finish your milk. And so we go on. You know, next slide. So there's this, uh, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. This is a think tank. It's in Cambridge. These are really smart people. Um, you know, we're not talking, you know, some of these people who think they're smart. These are actually people who, who are intelligent. <laughs> and um, they have a good grasp of resources and other people who take a look at our nation and say, what's happening? Um, where are we at? Um, where do we want to go? Uh, look at this um, expense that we have. Can we give some direction? So this think, think, tap, think tank came up with basically a concept. We can go to the next one. It's called the triple aim. And if you leave here today, this is what I just want you to really remember is the triple aim. Because this triple aim concept is what's behind basically everything that we see coming towards us. It's the foundation of the Affordable Care Act. It's why we have all of these other initiatives that are out there. And what is the triple aim? Well, the triple aim is basically an attempt to focus on health care costs. We want to make sure that we can get better health of our populations. We want to make sure that the care that we're giving is quality care, not just turning people through the system. We want to make sure the quality is there. And we want to be able to do this while improving costs. And that's the big thing. So whenever you're thinking about what's out there with health reform, I need you to understand just this right here. This concept is driving everything. Why? Because of the reality of our, of our, our debt and how much health care is costing us. So when Steve is up here talking about the Affordable Care Act and Sue is talking about you know, employer and insurance issues and what's happening, th this is what's driving it. We can go to the next one. So this is a real busy slide. Um, this is the concept design of how we want to fulfill the triple aim. This is where everyone can kind of agree on the idea and the concept, but implementing it is where all the problems come in. This is where you have Tea Party saying something, Republicans saying something, Democrats saying something. You know, and everybody knows there's a problem, but everybody has their own approach to it. Not only that, every little organization has an approach. So some of the concepts are focusing on the individuals and family. So what do we see with that? We see things like patient-centeredness. You know, is our organization patient-centered? You're going to see a big shift to going from the physician-clinician-centeredness to are we there for our patients? Um, primary care um, services and structures, are people getting the basic preventative things that they need? Um, the patient-centered medical home, the patient-centered medical neighborhood. You know, these are all things you've heard of, but that's what one of the concepts is trying to reach. Population health management, that's big. You know, that's uh, making our population healthy. We can talk about diabetes, we can talk about CHF, or we can talk about associates and doctors and people that work for us is talking about making our communities healthier and involving more than just physicians but hospitals employers even insurance is actually uh, are actually showing true interest in this because they go down to the cost control issues cost control platforms um, system integration and execution so when we talk about ACOs and how we're trying to you know coordinate with other systems it's all because we're trying to reach this triple aim. Oh, I see a question way back there. Oh, uh, accountable care organizations. And uh, these are organizations that basically state, we're going to start taking care of a population of people. And we're going to make sure that they're going to have access to good care. And the care that we're going to give is going to be high quality care. And not only are they going to have high quality care, we're going to decrease costs. What does that sound like? The triple aim. They are basically organizations that are starting to group their resources together to try to improve population management, focusing on families, integrating systems. Um, we are part of one, and that's a whole other discussion of itself. But if there's anything else that I throw out there that 
you know, I talk this all the time, and just, just let me know. Okay, did I answer your question? All right, we can go to the next slide. So, we are in our world of change. We are living in interesting times. Um, Steve will talk about the Affordable Care Act, and there will be a lot of information, and that's probably why you guys are really here, is to hear the bulk of really what's important. Um, meaningful use. This is our EMR stuff. You know, all the things we're doing with our EMR, we've positioned ourselves fantastically for uh, meaningful use. Um, we had the foresight to see this. It's been painful. No one said this was going to be easy. It's been very painful. Change always is painful. Um, and we are in interesting times. Um, Wisconsin Health Information Organization. These, this organization um, wants to report provider performance in a language understandable to the layperson. What does that mean? That means your doctors are now getting measured. Hospitals are being measured. And they're being compared. So you can now go on to websites and you can see how Agnesian Healthcare does compared to another organization. This is to drive quality. You know, nothing makes you want to do something better than wanting to be better than your competitor. Um, so you'll see sometimes the way doctors communicate with you and the way your insurance companies communicate with you and what they demand of you is becoming a lot more strict. Um, EMR utilization, not only is it going to the electronic medical record, use of computers, it's going to be used not only by your um, providers, which we all see, but we want patients to actually start getting it. Patients are going to start being asked to access their charts from home, their labs from home, start making appointments from home, start tracking their health. So there's going to be a big push for increased um, electronics. Narrow networks, accountable care organizations, spoke a little bit about that. What does this mean, narrow networks? For some people, this means that you're going to be really required to see certain people if you're within a certain insurance program. Um, your options may not be as open as they once were. Now, you always have options. The question is, are you going to pay for it? So this is our reality in which each one of these things, you know, there are little branches that stem off of it. And there are a whole bunch of other health reform things that are going on as well. But it all comes back to that triple aim concept. Go. All right, so we're at the bedside. The reality is the providers, we're going to be there. We're all going to be there. We're still going to come. We're going to show up. We're going to do our job. We're, we're going to continue to be there for our patients and for each other. Um, that, that's not going to change. You're going to see a much more focus on wellness and prevention. I think we're all living that now when we talk about our BMIs and our LDLs and our smoking utilization and so forth. I mean, I'm constantly in the office now filling out wellness forms for people and their work and their insurance. It's, it's, it's commonplace now. Um, I can remember this a few years ago. I'd get one or two. Now it's every day I'm getting this. Um, cost. Ah, cost is becoming more of an upfront conversation. With the preventative things, it's wonderful. You know, a lot of the preventative services are going to be covered, and, and that's going to be wonderful. What's a little more difficult is when you're ill and you come in to see your provider, um, some of the conversation is going to be a lot more difficult. Do I, do I really need that CAT scan for that lung nodule? Um, do I really, really, really have to go and get that MRI? Do I need that blood test? Um, you know, so cost is becoming more upfront, where before, um, you know, a lot of physicians, we and clinicians, we cost was never a major issue. You know, we just order a test because we think it's indicated. Well, now it's becoming more of a conversation. Um, more attempts at communication improvements. We already talked about electronic records, but we're also seeing things like navigators. You know, our navigators are trying to help that transition from the hospital to the outpatient world. But we're also going to have navigators crossing systems from freighter to Agnesian, Agnesian to freighter, and all over the place. So communication is key for this. Um, and reminders, you know, you get your colonoscopy reminder at age 50, so don't forget to get your colonoscopies, okay? Mammograms, pap smears, you know, all of the cancer screening things that are out there, there's going to be a lot more focus on this. And before, we used to put a lot of this in, you know, our own hands. It was up to me to show up. Well, now that my provider and their organization are being measured, if I don't follow up, I'm counted as, you know, a negative. So now organizations are pushing more, um, becoming more paternalistic, which a lot of us don't like, but that's kind of the world we're entering, entering into. So the triple aim is the concept I don't want you to forget. Um, when I took organic chemistry, there were those who 
memorize the formulas. Okay, part of the uh, health reform is the Affordable Care Act, meaningful use, and, and they go down a list. But those who, who understood organic chemistry understood the concepts behind it, behind single, double, triple bonds, and so forth. Understand the concept of the triple aim of health care costs, and it's going to explain a lot of what's happening in our world when we come you know, to work every day. So at this point, I think Steve is up next to give you some good information about the Affordable Care Act. Um, thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Colmenares. He said, you know, some people just try to be smart. And that would be me, by the way. I, I fall into that category. <clears throat> Who took organic chemistry in college in here? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I remember my college roommate, uh, who is an internist in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota now. His name is Steve Nordmark. Um, he, 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 according, was in that track. And I looked at inside the cover of the book once, and I just quickly shut it. And I'm like, oh, my god. This is well beyond my uh, mental capacity. So good morning, good new year, happy new year. Uh, we've got a, a bit of spring upon us, right, at 20. Who thought, who would ever think 25 would be really special, <laughs> right? Oh, I do have it upside down, I told you. OK, so Derek came at this from a global standpoint of, you know, what's reform? What are we trying to accomplish? And now I'm going to talk about the Affordable Care Act. Some of you may want to refer to this as, the, as Obamacare. Um, it's, it's kind of a slang, and I, I think most of you know that I'm not a huge fan of the current administration, uh, but I, I just don't like the slang term, so I'm going to refer to it as the Affordable Care Act. Um, this is the biggest overhaul that we've had in the health system. Who was working in health care in 1985? That's, pr that's probably age discrimination, so I won't. <laughs> Perry, you raised your hand. <laughs> Mary Sue, you're not that old. Come on. No kidding. Wow, I had you down for 92. Yeah. <laughs> Since uh, 1965, who remembers DRGs when they came in? That was going to be the death of health care. Remember? We're done. And we somehow, we adapted, adopted, felt the pain, made modifications, and moved forward. And I think that's the one thing I want you to leave today with is um, this is going to be painful or let me restate, this has been painful, and it's going to get more painful as we get into ICD-10 and the full use of the electronic health record and some of the, the population health management and risk-based payments and all those types of things. It's going to be painful, but you know what? We're going to be all right. I was in, I was in Arizona recently, and I was watching the Packer game um, in a, an establishment. I won't tell you what kind of stuff. Maybe <laughs> might have been a bar, but... Um, and I run into who... Ed Howe, Dennis Young, and his wife are sitting right next to us. And I knew I recognized him, but I didn't. Anyways, he said, oh, I'm so glad I'm out of health care. And I said, Ed, I'm so glad I'm in health care because we got, we've got some great work ahead of us. Bottom line for this is uh, the Affordable Care Act, all right, has a lot of things in it. It requires all of us to have some form of insurance. I mean all of us, every person in the United States, all right? Requires insurance companies and employers to provide consumer protections related to health coverage, like covering pre-existing conditions, not changing, charging more for coverages based on gender, et cetera. These are all good things. These are all good things. I, I lean on the right side of the political spectrum, but I like the Affordable Care Act in a lot of different ways. These are good things. People, everybody in America to have insurance? People to be able to receive, get insurance coverages be, uh, without uh, being, having limits because of pre-existing conditions. Uh, the act providing primary care uh, facilities to everyone, it's a good thing. What are the key elements? Um, free preventative care. Everybody likes free, right? And that, it, while that can be debated, it's like, who's going to pay for that? Who is going to pay for that? So there's a lot of things that cause complications within this act, but having free care is good, and that's, I believe, Sue, you're gonna talk about that. That's part of our current plan now, 1-1 of 2014. Um, your primary care services as it relates to preventive services are no, at no cost to you, correct? So that's a good thing. Individual mandate, people who cannot afford health insurance but do not have coverage into that may pay a fee or will have to pay for all their health care. Okay, what does that mean? Um, 
and I'll go, I've got some slides there. Um, and what we did, what the federal government did was in crea created these health insurance marketplaces as a new way to find health coverage. And you all know, and our CAC is sitting back there, have been dealing with this for three months plus, ladies. By the way, if there's experts in these room, it's those four ladies. They can answer all your questions, all right? So um, uh, they can help you if you don't have coverage now and if you, and if you don't want to look at other options. The Affordable Care Act, um, it also includes a patient bill of rights uh, that offers us protections, which is a good thing. The individual mandate requires most people to have a minimal essential health coverage. Beginning in 2014, uh, most individuals must either have health insurance that meets a minimum standard or pay a penalty. Okay, here's where the government kind of messed up and I'll talk a little bit about. Minimal essential coverage is defined as any marketplace plan or any individual insurance plan that you already have. An employer plan, including COBRA or uh, with or without grandfathered status, including a retiree plan. That includes Medicaid, Medicare, uh, the CHIP program, TRICARE programs for government employees, Peace Corps volunteer plans, etc. So here's the problem. The act is not perfect, all right? And this is why it's being criticized. The annual tax penalty for not having minimum essential coverage uh, depends on age and the number of dependents in your household. It's going to be a flat dollar amount or it could be a percentage of your income uh, and it will increase over the next three years. So here's, uh, the, here's the reality, all right? So in 2014, if you don't want to take health insurance, you're going to pay a 95, if you're a single person, 25 years old, you're going to pay a penalty of $95. Well, guess what? Who's gone on the marketplace and looked at to see how much an insurance plan costs? Minimum that I've seen CACs is about, uh, for, without subsidies, is around five to seven hundred dollars per month without subsidies. Kathy? Um, for, young, for, for catastrophic coverage, but that doesn't cover anything other than a catastrophic event. So if I'm a young 25 year old, and you know, remember when we were 25, and there are probably some 25 year olds in here, you're invincible. I'm healthy, I never get sick, it's not a big deal. Why would I go out and spend three to four to five hundred dollars a month when I can just pay a $95 penalty? Of course, I'd pay the $95 penalty. So that's the problem with the act, all right? Um, if you have children, you pay $95 plus $47.50 for each child. Again, if you're a family of two, three, four, and you're a single mom, dad, whatever it may be, I'd pay the penalty. Um, so, and or it's 1% of income, whichever is greater. Next year, it goes to 325, still not very much. And in 2016, now we're starting to talk, now you're saying 695 per adult, 347 for each child, up to 2,085 for families, or 2.5% of income, whichever is greater. Granted, these penalties, by the way, are going to be assessed through your income tax reporting. That's a whole other problem. I don't think the IRS has got that figured out, all right? So stay tuned for that. But those are the penalties. So that's what's part of the problem. So you know, you've heard about, you've, I mean, if you've had to be living, living under a rock if you haven't heard about the, all the insurance marketplace issues, but um, the insurance marketplace creates an alternative for buying insurance. In theory, it's a good thing. In theory, it's a good thing. They will offer a choice of different plans. By the way, uh, the plans in our marketplace in Fond du Lac County are a RISE Health Plan, Dean Health Plan, and Common Ground Health Cooperative. And they have, under Common Ground, there's two products. They have the Empower product and the Envision product. And the Envision is Aurora only. So a great little story. Um, uh, one of the CACs was, wh who, which one of you was signing that person up? Who was helping with that person? Or did somebody fabricate that story for me? Um, well, I should, I should tell it before so you can answer which one of you did it, right? <laughs> I get it. So, we spent an hour plus with this person, um, helping them get enrolled in the marketplace, and they choose the Arise Envision product, Aurora only. So we just spent all this time and energy helping this person choose the Aurora product. Mm -hmm. Kathy, was that you? So, you know, that's a little bit frustrating. But, so, anyways, those are the plans that are available to us. In Dodge County, it's Arise and Dean Health Plan as well. So the, the reality of this is, from my perspective, is there's, there's not a lot of choice. There's not a lot of choice. Yes, there's a rise, dean, and common ground, but there's not a lot of choice. Where's United? Where's Anthem? Where's uh, Aetna, Humana, et cetera? Kathy? 
right? That's why I didn't mention it. <laughs> um, they provide information to help consumers understand their coverage operation, uh, options. That's in theory, that's what that's supposed to do. Individuals can purchase insurance through a marketplace um, if they are currently not incarcerated. Uh, lawful United States citizen or resident living at, in the service area of the marketplace. So what will the plans cover? All plans are a comprehensive package. Uh, will cover basically essential health benefits, ambulatory patient, emergency services, hospitalization, maternity and newborn care, mental health, prescription drugs, et cetera, just what you would expect. Uh, rehabilitative, laboratory services, preventive and wellness disease, pediatric services, et cetera. So um, I did a, we did a public presentation and I presented this slide. And this was right, this was on November 11th of the New Yorker after the, uh, they had a massive failure. The month of October was horrible. And it's a spoof on Kathleen Sebelius and President Obama. He's got the old school cell phone and she's got her fingers crossed. And then we have the little geek down here in the bottom with a uh, four and a half or five and a half inch. Remember, remember the old floppy disk? Putting it in the machine, you know, hoping that the uh, marketplace would work. I thought it was cute. And then the next thing was, um, uh, radioing into the White House, your new health care team has arrived, sir, and uh, it would be the geek squad. But a huge, huge black eye for this administration in not being able to deliver a operational marketplace, insurance marketplace, on October 1st. A huge setback and really a detriment to uh, the people that are trying to access it. I make light of it, but it's really not that funny. There are some people that have been significantly disadvantaged because of this work. So here's the deal um, as it relates to the Affordable Care Act. Um, thank God you work at Ignatian Healthcare. Not because of us, but because of our commitment to provide you health insurance. And you have my word, every one of you, every one of you, that that is core to who we are. There's an option here, uh, as you well know, that um, Walgreens. Who's heard of the Walgreens story? Raise your hands. Okay, a few of you. What Walgreens do? Walgreens said, you know what? We can pay a penalty. Ignatian Healthcare could do this today. We could pay, uh, it's a 20 some hundred dollars, I forget the exact amount. Coming up, Sue will tell you. We could pay that penalty for each one of you and give you $1,000 and say, go, good luck. Go help, go help yourself in the insurance marketplace. Knock yourself out, find something. We could. And if you do the math after Sue puts this up, we could probably save Round numbers, 10 million. I, we could make budget, Bonnie Schmitz isn't in the room, but we can make our budget this year, which we're behind on, by the way. Uh, we can make our budget. But you have my word, that won't never happen as long as I'm here. Bottom line. It would be incredibly hypocritical if we're in the business of providing health care and we don't provide health insurance to our own associates. And so you have my commitment on that. Will we continue to tweak change and try to control costs under that health plan? Yes, that's a given. And you've seen it this year. And I know some of you are sitting in this room who are less than a 0.8 FTE, and you have been impacted by that. And I feel bad about that, but there are choices in life and we have to make tough choices every day. That's what I get paid to do. So anyways, that's my commitment to you. Um, we will never ever get to a point where we're gonna not offer health insurance to you. It's just core to who we are and core to our mission. So um, that's the good news and that's what I want you to leave with today. I want you to leave also with today with a, with a uh, sense of enthusiasm about the challenges that this act uh, presents. We are, and some of you have heard me say, we are at a time in history, in our lives, where we can be involved in some of the most meaningful change that this country has ever had. We do not have a federal budget problem. This, I'm, quote, I'm, I'm paraphrasing something I read. We have a health care problem. You think about it. What does the federal government spend the most amount of money on? Some would say, oh, it's defense. It's not. It's health care. It's Medicare. We have a health care problem. And so w what a great time to be part of uh, history in helping our country get to a place where we can have something that's sustainable, that's meaningful, that's better than what we've had in the past. And you can look back in 20 years and you can be sitting around the Christmas tree next year or in 20 years and say to your grandchildren or their children, uh, hey, I was part of that. I, was, I, I helped uh, implement that. I was part of that era. 
and what a great thing that you, what a great uh, history to have left. So that's the way I look at it, and that's the way I want you to look at it, if possible. Will you be frustrated? Will you be angry? Will you um, want to throw your hands up and scream and yell and say, this is the worst thing that's ever happened? Yep. Uh-huh. It's going to happen. But bear with it. It's going to evolve over time. And I think at the end of the day, sometime in the near future, hopefully the next three to five years, we're going to look back and say, this has been good for everyone. With that, Susan Edminster, please. In my role as Vice President of Human Resources, I have the opportunity to work with a very talented team and to take all this high-level information and sort through it and figure out what does it mean to Ignatian and what does it mean to our associates. So my role today is to give you a little glimpse at what we've done within our organization to comply with health care reform and what's headed our way in the future. So I will advance the slide. Oh. Okay. Um, giving you an understanding for what where we are today, um, requirements that were met under the Health Care Reform Act included the waiting period. And we've had a waiting period here for our associates to get onto the health insurance plan of, it's the first of the month following 30 days of employment. So we've met this, it required 90 days. We've been providing that for a period of time. Associate dependent children need to be covered until age 26. For those of you such as myself that have children that are older and still finding their way in life, this has been a wonderful benefit. So again, if you have a child, it used to be where they needed to be a full-time student, and that requirement has changed. So that we currently are meeting as well. Steve and Dr. Comaneris talked a little bit about first dollar coverage for preventative work. We've been providing that for a period of time. I know one of the challenges that we have within our organization is when something moves from being preventative to being diagnostic, and that transition there. So preventative work is covered when things move from a preventative um, environment to being more diagnostic, when they order additional scans, when they take a look at um, polyps, things like that with their colonoscopy, that becomes diagnostic and is no longer preventative. On the next slide. Thank you. The flexible spending account, you'll notice that that has changed over a period of time. That was a government requirement that the amount of dollars that an associate can put into their flexible spending account was capped at 2500 So that has been put in place. And then wellness coverage, and we'll talk a little bit more what we're doing around wellness, but the health care reform allows us to spend up to 30% of our cost of coverage on wellness-related activities. So on the next slide, these are changes that we had to put in place for 2014. The first one is we needed to make some changes and some tweaks around how we covered essential health benefits. There were a few benefits that we still covered with an annual dollar amount. We would say we'll pay up to $10,000 for this um, specific service. And we needed to make a change and we moved that from a dollar amount to a number of visits so that we could be in compliance with the plan. So there still um, are some things that have a limit in terms of therapy, services, things like that. Um, how, many, how many visits you can have. All lifetime dollar limits were removed. It used to be, um, and I'm dating myself in healthcare, but it used to be where individuals had a one or two million dollar lifetime maximum. After you reached that maximum, you were out of luck. That was all that was covered. That is now removed. So if anyone has an extremely catastrophic event, that will continue to be covered. And then pre-existing conditions were prohibited for participants and dependents. We've been always meeting that for children, but we did make a change in our plan in 2014 also for adult participants. So on the next slide, one more change that we had in um, 2014 is we needed to make a plan amendment to our health plan to allow for our wellness program to cover alternative standards of achievement. And we'll be talking a little bit more, especially in the forums, as we talk about our wellness program. One of the things that you'll see is all of the um, opportunities that you have as associates to improve your health and maintain your health need to have an option for coaching or completing a workshop, an alternative standard of achievement. So we will be embedding that into our program in 2014. 
And then there are fees. The government likes to collect their money, so there are some additional fees that as an employer we're required to pay. In 2013, it was actually a dollar per associate, and in 2014, that's moving up to $2 per associate, which isn't a significant amount of money that we need to pay the government. But there also is a fee right now um, proposed for September of this year, which would be about $63 per associate. So again, they're starting to collect some dollars to fund some of these things. On the next slide, impact that we're going to have in 2015. This is something that was delayed. I, I think one of the areas that we have in human resources is the challenge. A lot of things, as they've gone through the courts, they've been contested. There's been different um, levels of organizations coming forward, and some of the things have gotten delayed. This was initially something that was going to be implemented in 2014. It got delayed to 2015. It um, requires employers with more than 50 full-time employees, which we obviously have, that we must provide minimum value and affordable insurance to our associates. And we've done several different levels of analysis, and we do meet that currently at this time. On the next slide, tracking eligible employees. <clears throat> this will be the challenge that we have going into 2015. This requires that all of our associates need to be offered health insurance if they're working an average of 30 hours a week or more. And what this means to us is those individuals, and we do have um, individuals throughout the organization that might be in a status of a point two FTE or maybe even an occasional status, if for a period of time, and our measurement period is going to be a 12-month period starting in October through the end of the following September. If you've averaged 30 hours a week, regardless of what FTE you have, we need to offer you health insurance. So we are in the process of looking at how we are capturing those hours and being able to um, give that information back so that you have that ability to enroll insurance if you fit in that qualification window. On the next slide. We alluded a little bit to this. What if we didn't provide insurance? As an employer, that is one of the options, and I know when we had our community forum, we did have some individuals who came in from the community whose employers were dropping coverage. I don't know if anyone in the room was impacted, but we had spouses who had um, their employer decided we're not going to offer insurance anymore. So there are individuals or organizations that are doing that. What is the penalty to Ignatian? And as two examples, the first example here is um, if we totally drop coverage and we didn't offer anything at all, it would be $2,000 times the number of full-time associates that we have, and it would be about $4.1 million that we would have as a penalty to Ignatian. On the next slide, if we decided simply not to offer affordable coverage, we would have a different level of penalty. That would be $3,000 per associate. And again, based on if we had 100 employees who fit that criteria, it would be about a $300,000 penalty. As Steve has mentioned, we have committed to the organization to not move in that direction. It is not the right thing for our associates. It's not the right thing for our community to not offer health insurance. Other, other organizations have made that difficult choice. That is not in our future. On the next slide, a couple things that are coming up in the years ahead. Automatic enrollment, similar, so if a new associate comes into the organization right now, we automatically enroll them in their 401k, which I think is a great thing because we get them started and get a foot in, they're getting used to contributing. They're looking at automatic enrollment for health insurance too, so that we would automatically enroll someone into one of the level of plans and they would need to opt out or make a change from that. The Cadillac tasks is something that we're taking a look. It will impact us right now. It looks like in 2018 if it stays as it exists in the plan. And it would mean a significant penalty right now to Ignatian based on how rich our program is. And then there's additional reporting. Um, and and um, we have to include the dollars that we're spending on wellness. We have to um, take a look at how we're um, incentivizing um, changes in outcomes. Those are all additional reporting requirements that we have. The question is, if we had a Cadillac plan, why would the government require employers to pay additional money? I personally think the government's moving in a direction where, similar to where Canada is, in that it's a national health care um, controlled by the government that is offered across the organization. So they're looking at ways that they will disincentivize employers from providing individual coverage. Do you have anything to add to that, Steve? That's great. Similar? Okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> On the next slide, 
I think it's important to visit what we pay as an organization. We're self-insured, so what that means is we pay for our own expenses. We don't have a firm out there that you know, provides our claim costs. So when someone comes in and they, has, they have a procedure done or they need to see the physician, that comes out of our own pocketbook. So some years we have good years. The last couple have been fairly good in terms of the amount of money that we're bringing in with premiums and what the organization supports has been, um, has, has had a positive variance. Some years when you have catastrophic, you have large claims, and we'll share a little bit about our history in the next slide, um, it, it, it becomes more difficult to balance that. In 2013, we had $19.3 million that we had budgeted um, of that. 1.1 was in prescription expense. Associates contributed 3.8 in your premiums, the amount of co-pays or the amount of um, premium that you paid. And so the organization paid $15.5 million towards health insurance costs for our associates. Putting that in perspective with our new facility being built in Ripon, that's about a third of the cost of that facility. So it's a significant investment that we're making for health insurance to our associates. In addition to that, we have dental, we have your 401k match. Those are all things that, again, from an employer perspective, are very meaningful and, and impactful to you. The total spend per associate is right around $10,000. On the next slide, you've been hearing a lot about wellness, this know and go. We started last year about this time, really getting out and um, talking about why it's important. 1.3% uh, of our members, 67 members, incurred $50,000 or more of claim costs last year, which is about 33% of our health care spend. So again, we have some associates who are heavy utilizers and heavy, and heavy need. We have 611 covered members, and that is defined by looking at our claims history and taking a look at um, the disease states, asthma, cancer, chronic health failure, COPD, diabetes, and ERSD. And we spend about $6.1 million caring for that group. So here is where our opportunity is to take a look at how do we make sure those individuals that especially have chronic disease, there's things like cancer and, and you know, transplants, things that we don't have a lot of ability to help associates manage their health. But how do we make sure that individuals that do have a disease state, obesity, things like that, how do we make sure that we are engaging and providing the resources so that you can make improvements? What can we do to incentivize and make sure that individuals are compliant, that they're coming in when they need to have their A1C um, taken, that they're coming in and having their blood pressure taken on a regular basis? On the next slide, just to give you some dollar amounts, these are dollar amounts that our insurance agency has, our broker has identified that we have opportunities to engage our associates in making improvements. So it's things like under respiratory disease, helping our associates stop smoking. Doesn't happen overnight. I think the average individual needs to quit five or six times before they're successful. What can we do to help provide resources and incentivize our wellness program to, to assist in that? Diabetes and obesity. Again, you know, uh, challenges that we're running through no and go, getting people into the exercise um, routine, helping people understand in the cafeteria, uh, you know, a lot of challenges with removing those fryers, but, you know, having, having things at your fingertips in terms of which are the healthy foods. On the next slide, kind of switching over and taking a look at what does healthcare, how does healthcare reform impact our workplace? And I think the biggest impact that we're we're starting to see a little bit now. The market has turned around, the stock market, so your investments in a lot of cases are doing better. We have more associates that are reaching that retirement age and trying to make a decision what's their next step. And now with the healthcare exchanges, we have concerns that we're gonna have very talented, knowledge-based individuals leave the organization. They're going to retire early because they'll be, they may not be eligible for Medicare. But on the next slide, you'll see they may be able to go to the exchanges to be able to get their health insurance through the exchanges. Again, um, in the past, that wasn't the case. And then just the ongoing administrative compliance that I alluded to in terms of record keeping. Those are the other um, impacts that it has to us in human resources as we look at health care reform. So at this point, I'll invite Steve Little and Dr. Colmenares back up for any questions that you might have. The question was, um, given that there are some 
insurance offerings within the marketplace that exclude Ignition Healthcare. Um, do we know how many people have selected a plan that doesn't include Ignition or, Aurora, or has selected a plan that includes Aurora? Or, um, and, and uh, do we know what the impact to Ignition Healthcare is going to be? Um, I don't. We, uh, we do not know how many people, to the best of my knowledge, have selected a plan that does not include Ignition. So stay tuned on that, Leanne. I think we'll know more. I went online yesterday to try to get some stats um, on how many people have enrolled statewide, you know, countywide, and so on. I think that information is going to be forthcoming. Also, it's a work in progress because people can still uh, enroll through March 15, 31st, Kathy. So it, we're going to have to kind of wait probably until the second uh, quarter of the calendar, uh, calendar year to understand what it all means. Um, I will tell you, um, I don't believe um, in my heart, and this is going to come from my gut without any factual information, that the impact today to Ignition Healthcare of people enrolling in a plan that is exclusive Aurora or exclusive someone else is going to be significant to us. And the reason for that is because of, of our strategic presence, um, and, and, uh, and we're proud of that, in that think about it, if, you're, if you really live in Fond du Lac, you really need to have access to Ignition Healthcare because we're it. Granted, Aurora has primary care and some outpatient surgical things and so on and so on. Um, so I don't believe the impact is going to be great. Um, will it be something? Yes. And that's why we're involved with our Accountable Care Organization, which is known as Accountable Care Solutions or Quality Health uh, Solutions. By the way, the name is a little bit in flux right now. And that is, just to remind you, uh, six health systems, Columbia St. Mary's, Wheaton Franciscan, the Medical College, Fredert, and Ministry Healthcare, which is huge, by the way. Ministry includes the affinity system, plus all the ministries throughout the central and northwestern part of the state and ourselves. And if you think about that accountable care network, which is narrow, by the way, and we are signing, we have a contract. We have a contract with United Healthcare for about 100,000 lives, roughly. Total. Total, of which there's about 3,000 in our marketplace, of which those people that are in that plan are restricted to use us. And so we're going to continue to do that. That accountable care organization has tons of leverage, and I think will be the will allow us to compete very effectively. Stay tuned. Um, Angie. Angie's question is, I've had a couple of associates that have come to me and said, I'm not signing up for a plan because there's been a breach of information. And let me then come back to you. With, you're, these are associates that are seeking coverage under the marketplace? Yes. Uh, yes. So they, uh, they've come to me and said, we don't, we're hearing it's not safe to sign up. Our information is not safe. Safe. Yeah. Okay. So um, associates are saying, we're not, uh, by the way, why aren't they accessing our insurance? I see. Fair enough. Um, <clears throat> so those are associates that are under 0.5 that are seeking insurance in the marketplace are saying, hey, I'm not sure that I want to go there because I've heard that the marketplace website is not very secure and my information, um, there could be security breaches and my information could be spread all over the country. Um, that is a rumor. Um, and I do not know of any factual statements. A lot of people that are anti-affordable care act have come through and said, oh, the this, this site is so poorly designed that people are going to be hacking into my data and so on and so on. I think um, I have not heard, there's not been anything disclosed publicly that there's been a breach of data uh, or security with the marketplace. Is it possible? Sure. You all heard what happened to Target, didn't you? I just saw, I got a bleep today, what, 70 million people were affected by, which my wife went to Target that, during that time frame. But. So I, I, do, I would encourage your associates to not be, uh, it's a concern with anything, by the way. I've had my credit card poached like three times in the last six months. Um, it's just life. And so I would not let that be a barrier to people enrolling in the marketplace. Um, CACs, do you agree? Disagree? Kathy said, there is some concern, but she agreed with what I said. Good answer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. Other questions? I know this is not as exciting as interventional radiology and <laughs> next month, Dr. DeGear and podiatry, and, but 
It's life. Yes. Liz said, hey, are, you know, we've, we take care of all. And by the way, we're going to continue to take care of all. We are going to continue to take care of all. It's our purpose in life. It's our mission. But if people come to us who are enrolled in the marketplace that have, Aurora, have a, the Aurora exclusive plan, are we going to take care of them? The answer is maybe. We're going to encourage them to go where their insurance coverage is, because that's in their best interest. And that's, that's being a good steward of our resources. And if at the end of the day, um, they're there for emergent care, accordingly. We, we, we're going to care for anybody that comes to our emergency room, regardless of anything. But if they're there for, pr pr for primary, primary care, preventative care, and they have a plan, and it's the Aurora exclusive plan, we're going to encourage them to go see Aurora. Now, um, at the end of the day, if they refuse and they don't like Aurora and da 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 da, then that's another conversation. But um, you know, we'll, at the end of the day, if somebody is in need of an essential health, essential health care for their well-being, and they have Aurora's plan, and they refuse to go to Aurora for whatever reason, and they have to have us, we'll take care of them. Steve, we have a question here in Wapai. Sure. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, by the Actually, way, just, just as a side note, I refed a hockey game last night in Wapan <laughs> beat Fond du Lac oh. High School, and it was a great it was a great game. They won five four in overtime, and that's a great day for Wapan. So, with that, <laughs> ask your question. I actually have two questions. Is there any limitations on lawsuits and? Why doctors are doing million dollar workups on elderly, like 70, 80, 90. They did an echo on a 90 year old woman. I just don't understand why they did that. And what's going to happen to the 26 year old who does not have any insurance? And what's going to happen if they have an illness and they come to the hospital, they incur hundreds of thousands of dollars of bills? Are we going to end up eating all of that? Because they're never going to pay for all of it. It's, is that Roger, by a chance? <laughs> God, God yeah. bless you, Roger, by the way. Um, I'm going to Col let Dr. Colmenares answer the first part of that as it relates to lawsuits and doing stuff. Yeah, with, with the, the one thing about health reform that we did not see is anything about tort reform. Tort reform is the term we use to talk about lawsuits and legality um, and a lot of people may understand that a lot of physicians practice um, medicine from a perspective that they don't want to get sued. They, they want to cover their hind ends. Um, so what do they do? They, they order tests because they don't want to get sued. There's nothing about tort reform in any of this. And that is a concern for a lot of physicians because how can you change a lot of what we do without assuring us that you're not going to get sued. So tort reform, it's not addressed. So to answer your question, Roger, I think there's going to be some, some physicians that can need to practice defensive medicine until we have meaningful tort reform. As it relates to your last question regarding the 26-year-old who has, who has said, I'm just going to pay the $95 penalty and comes in and has a catastrophic event and spends $100,000, will we have to eat that? The answer is yes. Uh-huh but we're doing it now. So what's the difference is kind of where I'm at, Roger, um, because that 26 year old hasn't had, has never had health insurance. So uh, I don't think the impact of people that elect not to have health insurance is gonna be greater for us. By the way, we are incredibly blessed in the markets that we serve, highly insured compared to other parts of the country. On average, about 90 to 93 percent of our population in uh, Fond du Lac Dodge counties uh, is insured. Blessed, blessed, blessed. Now, the, the area, Roger, to take your point another step further is where we are going to see increased bad debt in community care. I think we are. Community care and bad debt are going up. You can count on it. Why? Because all of us have greater coinsurances, some, and greater deductibles and high deductible plans. And we're, gonna, we're seeing the effects of that, and we're going to continue to see the effects of that. I started at the Fond du Lac Regional Clinic 30 years ago as a part-time employee. My husband is self-employed. At the time, he was working for his dad, who raised 10 kids with no insurance at oh, all. My. 
I knew back then that I needed to go to work for insurance. I was working part-time, starting out at $3.25 an hour, paying child care. There were months where I thought I would be paying them back for my health insurance. But as a part-time employee, I was very grateful that I was even offered the opportunity to get insurance. I've worked the whole time here basically for the insurance. Mm -hmm. Lately, with housing being so bad, I work for more than just the insurance. But <laughs> I truly am appreciative of the insurance. I am full-time now, so it does help me out a little bit better. And I am very grateful of your commitment to offer us the insurance at whatever cost it is. Thank you. I appreciate it.